Hi, everyone. Welcome to tonight's talk and tour. I am Krista Harmon, one of the career readiness consultants with the Kent Intermediate School District, and I'm delighted to be partnering with Orthopedic Associates of Michigan tonight. So welcome for, um, especially on such a beautiful night. I have three guests, actually, um, Lisa, your name's not on the slide. I should have just added that. Um, but we have um, three panelists that are on the screen and we have another one too. Lisa Itama is our human resource contact who's been so fantastic in putting this together. Welcome, Lisa. Thank we you. have Eric Schaefer, who is a physical therapist. Hello. And we have Maddie, who's an athletic trainer. And Megan is a billing specialist. And they all have very important roles at Orthopedic Associates Orthopedic Associates of Michigan and makes that place hum. So we're going to dig into people's career paths, get some information that hopefully will be helpful to, helpful to young people as we go on tonight. So welcome everybody. To get us started, I'd like to take you back to when you were 16 or 17 years old. And did you think you'd grow up to be in the occupation you're in? So let's start with you, Maddie. I'd like you to share um, your name, how long you've been at Orthopedic Associates of Michigan, and tell mm -hmm. us what you were thinking about back at 16. Yeah, my name is Maddie. Last name is pronounced to be Healy, so it's a little bit different than, than it looks. But um, I've been at Orthopedic Associates for four and a half years, a little bit over that. Um, and uh, when I was 16 or 17, um, I was interested in um, doing something in the orthopedic field. I had a, um, an injury, um, a sport-related injury. Um, and so was going through a lot of therapy, um, you know, had multiple visits with athletic training and then, and then bracing as well. And I kind of ended up spiraling into all of that, um, now. So it actually was kind of almost like a career defining age, um, back then for me specifically. So. Great. I look forward to digging into that. And oftentimes young people, that is, um, how careers get started. You have a personal experience and you're like, man, I like those people. Um, Megan, let's go to you. How long have you been with OAM and what were you thinking back when you were in 16? And you're a billing specialist for those of, um, that just joined in. Yes. And I'm sorry, my cat decided to make an appearance currently. <laughs> That's the fun of Zoom. The upstairs, but, um, <laughs> yeah, um, I've been with OAM for seven years. And um, originally when I was about 16 or 17, I actually wanted to be a wildland firefighter. So this is kind of a different path, but um, kind of took some classes and I liked the billing aspect of it and um, just dealing with different challenges. And so that's kind of the road I went. Great. And again, we'll, we'll dig into a little further what your job is all about and some of the training. Thank you for being here. Eric, welcome. Hello. How long have you been with OAM and what were you thinking when you were 16? So I've been with OAM for almost a year. And when I was in high school, I had it down between physical therapy and veterinarian. So I knew I wanted to do something healthcare related. Um, and I was exposed to PT as a patient uh, a few times and I co-opted a vet clinic my senior year and here I am. And here you are. Well, we're so glad to have you and we look forward to again digging in. Lisa, Human Resources, how long you been with OAM and what were you thinking when you were 16? Yes, I'm Lisa Idom, I'm the HR director. I've been with OAM for five and a half years. When I was in high school, I had no idea what I wanted to do. Um, Neither of my parents went to college, so I'm a first-generation college student, and I was just hoping I would hopefully figure it out in, in college, um, so kind of went undecided and found my path. Great. I'll definitely want to dig into some of those nuances of how you found your path. Um, so back to you, Maddie. Um, you had some injuries in high school, so that was something that had kind of piqued your interest. What do you remember about that time, and what about... Well, you know, actually, let me step back. I'd like for you to actually describe what an athletic trainer is. I'm going to have each of you describe what your job actually is for those that may not know what an athletic trainer is. And then we'll round back to everybody about uh, some of the things. Go ahead, Maddie. Sure. So um, an athletic trainer is a healthcare professional that um, really collaborates with so many disciplines in healthcare to provide um, emergency care related and um, therapy and um, just basic health treatment for um, student athletes. Um, you know, whether it be um, in the adolescent age, um, high school age, or, you know, college professional, that kind of thing. So you'll probably most uh, recognize them or the ones that they'll run on the field if someone goes down, you know, gets hurt or whatever kind of thing. That's the more traditional sense. Um, and then, 
you know, more and more recently, they are uh, being used within orthopedic clinics, um, actually really all medical clinics, but orthopedic mostly, because that's what the main background is. But we treat all from, you know, muscle injuries to, you know, bone, bony injuries to um, general um, medical injuries or, or situations. Um, and then right now I'm in uh, medical equipment. So specifically bracing, splinting, um, and that kind of thing to try to get people back to uh, doing what they love, really. So awesome. And that's the thing. There's so many cool specialties even within mm-hmm. what you're doing. So yeah, um, very many. college athlete's son just broke his ankle and we were actually okay. at your environment and he got his yeah. boot. And so yeah, yeah, I was thinking about you guys as we were doing that about two weeks yeah. ago. Yes. Um, thank you. And Megan, what billing specialist is? What do you do? Um, so I'm a billing specialist that does Medicaid and auto billing. So we have different different um we break it up by different insurance companies so we have like a blue cross biller um pride health uh just because we have kind of a large volume so we kind of specialize more in certain areas so a lot of what i do is um i deal with claims so any kind of claim rejections that we get um when we bill out a claim if it comes back and it's rejected then i do the research into it to figure out why it's rejecting sometimes it needs a modifier added sometimes um, I'm dealing with patients who are in an auto accident maybe 20 years ago. So I have to kind of write up an appeal and state like why that is still related to their car accident, their treatment. Um, so I deal a lot with that. I deal with attorneys um, trying to work through settlements on cases for auto patients, um, just mainly that kind of thing. Yeah, I think most people would not really be aware um, how much of an advocate you have to be for your patients. And they might not think about that in your job. So I love that. Thank you for sharing. How about you, Eric? Tell us what a physical therapist is. Yeah, it, the answer kind of varies uh, depending on what setting you're in. Uh, I'm in the outpatient orthopedic setting. So uh, we work with a lot of people that are coming in with pain um, or loss of motion or they had just had surgery. And so our goal is to try to get them back to functioning you know, and do what they were doing in the past. Um, but if you ask our patients, our job is to create pain. So. Yeah, pushing their bodies where their bodies don't want to go. Yeah. So they get back to full functioning. And I'll probably have you touch base on a few of the um, specialties you work alongside, uh, like occupational therapy even. Um, yep. We'll, we'll talk more about that. Thank you. Uh, Lisa, a lot of young people yep. don't know what human resources is. Tell us what that's all about. Yeah, so human resources is a support function. So it supports the business for pretty much all things people. So we help with recruitment and finding new employees. We help with employee development, um, helping with training and any education that they need. Um, We help process payroll. So making sure people are paid on time, um, help with benefits. So helping provide employee benefits and administering that, Um, dealing with employee relations. So if anybody is in trouble or may need some coaching, we help with that. Um, really all things that deal with people, we support the business that way. Um, you could go into a specialist role where you just focus on one of those aspects. So I have team members that one of them is just a talent acquisition specialist and does all things recruitment and onboarding. I have a payroll and benefit specialist where that's their focus, or you could be a generalist where you work on a little bit of everything. Um, so it kind of depends on the size of the company as well as just a setup, but you can do a variety of different roles and use a lot of different skills and just deal with all things people. It's, it's fun. So. And I think that's what's cool about hearing uh, like you're in Megan's job because you can still work in the healthcare field, um, but not being directly patient, you know, hands-on clinical. So I, I love that we're exposing young people to a variety of opportunities to be in the healthcare system. So Manny, when you had some of these injuries, tell us um, what about it did you notice right away that you're like, man, this might be a career for me. And how did you even know then how to get started? What are some of those things that did someone tell you about it? Did you do some research, do a job shadowing? Tell us those early steps. Yeah, so um, right away, it was a similar situation. Um, You know, went down on the basketball court, had an injury, athletic trainer came out, assessed everything. Um, And then really he kind of facilitated a lot of my care Um, after the fact between being referred to an orthopedic physician and to a physical therapist. Um, He actually was an athletic trainer and physical therapist. So I did a lot of that through him. Um, 
and then, yeah, it just kind of helped me navigate really A to B. And I think that's so important with um, being a young person and not having a ton of exposure to those kinds of scenarios. Um, just having somebody who, again, can help kind of you and your family navigate those kind of scary and um, uncertain instances, you know, when you're young. Um, so anyway, um, going that route, you know, you kind of start to think about that kind of thing. What do I want to be when I grow up, like really seriously at that age? So um, that was kind of my, my same thing. I was like, oh, this, I think, you know, you get to, to help, you know, I loved athletics. You get to help athletes or, you know, patients to, to get back to doing what they love, you know, if they have a setback, um, or that kind of thing, kind of across the board in terms of from the very start to when they're kind of, you know, you build such a good trust with those kind of people. Cause they're kind of there when it all happens and then help kind of help you through it and help family members through it. Um, so yeah, that was that was kind of how I knew that I wanted to look into that role. Um, I went to Grand Valley State University. Um, they have a phenomenal athletic training, pro both athletic training program and physical therapy program. Um, my main thing is I, uh, I didn't really wanna take any more physics or organic chemistry to get into physical therapy. So, um, so I went with athletic training, um, pursued that route and it ended, up, it ended up being a good one for me specifically, so. Well, I think you bring up such a good point, right? Because we can have an idea when we're 16 of exactly where we want to go, but sometimes life will will throw mm -hmm. us a curveball. And like you say, organic chem is not for any wimps. Nope. And so um, <laughs> if you're like, man, I, I don't want to keep trying in this, or I, and you find a little a little side road to keep going and you're still in that same environment and you're still mm -hmm. doing what you want to do. But those are the things that help young people start to discern like, oh, yeah, this is part of why I like, but I'll, I'll go this route. So yep, I'm glad you out what you're good at. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, how about you, Maddie, when, um, when you said you were thinking about being an outdoors type of job with the, what did you say a wildlife fire? Is that what you said? Yeah, I was going in to be a, uh, like a wildland understand. firefighter. Wireland, yeah. which, you know, is, there's such a huge need for that right now on the yeah. west side of our country. Um, but yeah, so how did you even fir first hear about this particular, um, was it someone that you knew that was doing it? Did you see an ad in the paper or on the internet? That don't, that dates me. Like <laughs> I, I read newspapers to find job leads. People don't do that anymore. Uh, how do you even know then to get started? How did that work out for you? Um, well, I had started going to college for um, wildland firefighting and fire science. And I really, I enjoy the sciences. Um, I've always kind of had a mind for science. So I really wanted to kind of do something like that. And when I was first doing the wildland firefighting, it was, it was working out great, but then life kind of threw me a curveball and ended up having my daughter. So um, it kind of became where I didn't want to have to be gone for long periods of time and stuff like that. So I had some a lot of credits. So I was trying to figure out kind of where I could apply them. So I did some research and I kind of tried to figure out what would be a good fit for me. And I knew because I wasn't necessarily your traditional student, because I was a little bit older that um, going to like a full-time on-campus program just wasn't gonna work for me because I, I had to work at least a couple jobs. So um, I actually went through um, college online through Grand Canyon University and I got my bachelor's in healthcare administration from there, so. Well, good for you for continuing to pursue and life threw you a curveball. And did you have, um, a uh, career coach at the college? Did you do some online testing? Like, how'd you even start to discern how you could use those credits? Did someone help you? Because I know Maddie, that was important for her to have someone kind of a, a mentor showing her the way. How did how that work for you? I really wish I could say that that's how it worked for me, but I honestly, I was first generation college too. And my parents really didn't know how to help me. And not that they didn't want to, they, they just didn't really know where to start. And I didn't really have a good connection with I did go to Lansing Community College for a while. I had some credits from there and I didn't really have a good connection with any of my advisors. So definitely a big piece of my advice is like talk to your advisors and just be up on that. Cause I took classes I didn't need to take and stuff like that. So, I mean, it all went towards my degree and, and so it worked out, but yeah, I definitely took kind of the rocky road to get there. Well, really what it shows um, to me, Megan, is that you really persevered. And it says a lot about your drive to, to not give up and that you just kept pushing in. So congratulations on that. Um, Eric, what, how'd you even know what undergrad to get? Like, what was some of those people guiding you? Cause you had a couple of things that you're looking at, like the vet, you said that you did some experiences <laughs> yeah. that kind of helped you decide. Yeah. So, 
uh, my senior year of high school, uh, my school had a program where I could work and get credit for it. And so I got placed at a veterinarian clinic. And so I got like firsthand exposure like within that clinic. And I realized that, you know, there's lots of things with that job that I liked, but I also didn't want to deal with certain aspects like, you know, the surgery would have been fine, but I didn't want to do like the euthanizing. And so I'm like, no, oh, that's a big part of that job. And so I'm like, I'm going to go where I can help people and not have to worry about that. Um, so then my, my, my other top, the other area I was debating between was physical therapy. And um, I had been a patient in high school. Um, my aunt worked at a clinic. And so I got to um, kind of be exposed a little bit that way. Um, she wasn't a PT. She worked at the front desk, but still um, the, uh, the, it was a small practice and the primary PT got to, I think, kind of spend a little extra time talking to me about, about things just because of who I knew there. Um, and so I went to Grand Valley. I did undergrad there and grad school. And luckily they, their grad school program is great for physical therapy. Um, and they had kind of a career path, like college path, like laid out for you, like for what they needed in order to apply for the grad school. And um, I occasionally met with an academic advisor um, just to make sure that everything was on the, the right path and the right track. And, um, and then I volunteered and job shadowed uh, all throughout undergrad. And I applied and here I am. And I wanted to point out just a few things you said, even in high school, that you know you took advantage of that program to be in the vet clinic and you yes. talked to your aunt and you know took the steps to talk to the vet. I want to encourage young people, those are the action steps that you have control over that will give you information that will help you make these decisions. Because how else will you know if you don't talk to people? We call it informational interviewing. It's kind of what I'm modeling to you right now is to ask people about their career paths and get those, those tidbits of information that will help kind of lay that path out. So that's so great that you had that opportunity. And it sounds like you continued that in college with the volunteering and job shadowing. What do you remember about even taking away from some of those job shadows? Did you learn about yourself? Did you learn about insides of the jobs? What were some of the advantages yeah. of that? Yeah, so um, to get into the, the graduate program, they actually required at least 50 hours of, um, of job shadowing, and it had to be in a variety of settings. So like I, from, you know, when I was in high school, the, the physical therapy that I knew was outpatient. Like I didn't really know what they did inpatient. I didn't know all the other aspects that they had. And so, um, so I was forced to go into different settings. So I went into Mary Freebed and I spent a semester uh, where I was basically like three hours every like, you know, Wednesday or whatever. Like I was there to, you know, be in the gym and I was there to help out the therapist um, with their patients. A lot of them were um, like spinal cord injuries. Um, some of them were some of the, the brain uh, traumas um, and head injuries. And so that was a whole different like aspect that I wasn't familiar with. Um, but I was, you know, I was glad that I got to see all that and I got to, to learn from some of the therapists there. Um, I did a couple different outpatient settings um, and each, each practice is slightly different too. And so you get to learn that all right, physical therapy is a job, but like there's so much like that you can do with it uh, once you actually have that, that degree. Yeah, you, there's definitely different um, pathways and I, I'd love, definitely like to come back to that. I do um, want to ask, because I know young people are thinking, did you have to set up those uh, job shadows for yourself? Is that something Grand Valley helped you identify? Because sometimes that's a little overwhelming for young people. How do you figure yeah, that out? Yeah, so when I was, yeah, so in undergrad, um, basically I had to take like the initiative to contact um, the appropriate person. Mary Freebed has a ton of, um, you know, people looking to get, you know, experience hours and, and job shadow hours intern interning there. And so they had, uh, yeah, I think it was somebody through their HR department um, that you contact and you fill out, you know, forms, kind of like you're applying for a job essentially. And, and they, they required, like, if you're going to do it, like you have to do it on a set schedule. Um, some of the other smaller practices, you know, I could say like, Hey, I've got like this chunk of time, like this week, like, you know, can I go through and, and, you know, can I come in for a couple hours for a couple of weeks and just get a few hours here and there. Um, or you know, in the summertime, you know, when I wasn't taking classes, you know, I spent like two hours after one of my summer jobs every, you know, Tuesday or whatever day of the week it was, um, just with the, with just with one therapist and and hung out with them there. And um, and then I also did. Uh, Grand Valley had a pre physical therapy club, and so I was involved with that. And you know, they 
you know, especially as like a freshman and sophomore, that was very valuable because there's people that were, you know, just getting ready to apply or had already been accepted into a graduate program. So I got to kind of pick their brains a little bit and hear from them, like what the experience was like so that I could kind of prep myself. Yeah, that's such a great piece of advice, you know, to join any of those extracurricular where you're meeting people who have similar interests and you can get leads on things or, you know, kind of get some insights that maybe you didn't know about because again, yeah. we don't know what we don't know. So thank you for that. Yep. Lisa, you went off to college. You were a little undecided. Like, how did you even hear about HR? What what kind of led you to that? And tell us about some of those internships or other experiences that helped you clarify that. Yeah, so my freshman year at Green Valley, went to Green Valley as well, um, I took a career exploration class. It was a one credit class and it did a ton of personality tests. I think it did the Myers-Briggs, basically just assessing what you like, what you don't like, where you think your skills fall to try and determine what careers may be a good fit based on that. Um, so I took that class. A lot of things were pointing towards business. Um, one of our assignments was an informational interview. So we were actually required to do that as part of the class. So I interviewed somebody in human resources um, just to get her input on what she does every day, um, what led to her deciding that. Um, and it was actually my cousin. So um, she was a great resource. And um, so a lot of things are pointing towards HR or business, at least. I actually went the finance route at first and <laughs> didn't go HR. Um, so I started out with some finance classes, but then got to an investment class. And that was way over my head. I did not like numbers that much. I like them a little bit, but that was way too much. Wanted to get a little bit more back into the people aspect. Um, so went back to human resources. Um, my senior year, I just had a conversation with a professor in passing, had a question on an exam, and she asked me if I was looking for an internship. Um, I said, I absolutely would be open to that. Um, so she helped get in contact with that. I was actually at Spectrum. Um, so I did that my last semester at Green Valley, continued to have some classes with this professor, and she recommended taking a look at grad school. Um, so Michigan State has a human resources and labor relations program that is really strong. Um, so I applied just to see if I could potentially get in. Um, if not, I was going to take a look and maybe look at getting an administrative role or some type of office role um, just to get some experience. But I was accepted into grad school and went to that program, had several more internships um, while I was in grad school and ended up starting out as an HR business partner right out of grad school. That's great. So just from your experience, why, I guess for young people that maybe don't understand like the value of those internships, mm -hmm. what would be your recommendation? Why should you pursue an, an internship if it, even if it's not a college requirement? Yeah. So I didn't take it for course credit and it was an unpaid internship. So I had to work on top of that too, which was hard, but it was a good experience just to get in. You can learn about it in the classroom, but it's so much different. Um, actually, working alongside those that are doing it every day and just understanding the different avenues and different aspects you can go within that career. Um, so I worked with a special projects team. I got to look at um, performance reviews and how that works within a large organization. Um, so got a lot more exposure to something that you would see in the classroom. Yeah, so just a recommendation for young people that are watching this, you know, to really pursue those internships because it's giving you kind of a trial run. It helps you start to mm -hmm. learn what a workplace is like. Maddie, let's talk about your education. Did you do an internship? And for young people, um, I, I'm not gonna go too much into what the actual requirements are for some of these roles, because you can do that on some websites, which I'll share at the end. But Maddie, I'd like to hear about your internships, but looking back at your education, I'd like to see if there's any lesson learned, something you might do differently, something you wanna make sure young people know about the education portion of your career path. Yeah, um, so, um... It is a, I, I have a bachelor's degree, a bachelor of science in athletic training. It is now switched to a master's degree program. Um, so that I think is something that as a young person, you'd really have to make sure that you're committed to going. Cause it's almost like you can't really get a bachelor's and then go to a master's if you wanted to kind of thing. It's kind of all built in um, to a master's program with being, I believe five or six years now. Um, so again, something that you, you're committed to and really wanting to make sure that you want to do, I would 100% recommend any type of job shadow um, or, or just even talking to somebody. But yeah, like, um, like Lisa and Eric were saying, really getting, getting into the job and making sure that um, this is something that you're wanting to do. Um, I think I, I did that, you know, going, you know, I did some job shadowing. We had clinical rotations um, every semester. There's a specific 
program um, that's you know credentialed by this national accrediting body that um, for this athletic training program that um, accredited schools have to abide by. There's a curriculum and clinical requirements and um, that kind of thing. So basically, we go to class eight to noon ish. Um, and then right about one, two ish, we go to our clinical sites. It could be at a high school, could be at a PT clinic, um, could be at an orthopedic clinic, um, you know, so on and so forth. So um, that was something that was built into our curriculum, which was awesome. Um, I really did like that aspect of it when I was a supporting person, <laughs> you know, I was kind of like the second or it would help out on some things. Um, and then I did uh, move into a full-time athletic trainer after I graduated, um, at a high school, um, by myself or, you know, mostly by myself and, um, just wasn't that setting specifically wasn't really for me as a, you know, I, I, I guess the, the anxiety and that kind of thing, um, kind of got to me. And there's so many people that really thrive off that more adrenaline breaking stuff with the emergency care and, um, you know, assessing things right then and there, you know, depending, you know, no matter what kind of injury it is, you know, it could be a life-threatening one, could be a minor one, um, that kind of thing. You never know, really know what you're going to get. And I think a lot of people really thrive on that. I just was not one of them come to find out. So um, that's why I really uh, shifted gears into the, the, into the clinical setting where everything's a little bit more structured, a little bit more um, of a controlled setting. Um, so I would say that was probably one of the things that, I, you know, I had to pivot a lot because that's the, the very traditional setting. Um, and then pivoted into something completely different. Now I'm kind of in a more of a niche um, profession with medical equipment um, as an athletic trainer, um, but but love that, love that aspect of it. Um, but yeah, definitely something that I think you got to really, really dive into it and make sure you're committed. And then this is something that you think you as a person are going to thrive. Like the setting is something that, you know, you as a person are going to thrive and are going to do well. And I think that'd be my biggest piece of advice. Yeah. Yeah, and sometimes you just don't know what you don't know until you do it, right? It's not until mm -hmm. you're out there by yourself that you're going to realize this doesn't match me. This is not good. But none of that education went to waste. You just, nope. like you said, you pivoted <laughs> and found a rule that, that works for you. So just an encouragement to young people. You, you can think you have it all figured out, but then totally. things might twist and turn. So that's mm -hmm. great. Um, so Megan, um, let's talk about your education, what it takes to go into billing. And is there anything you'd like to share lessons, uh, not lessons learned, but some tips and tricks that maybe you want young people to know about the education side? Um, I would definitely say uh, I didn't have any kind of job shadow opportunity because obviously my college was in Arizona. So it was kind of hard to coordinate anything like that. Um, and unfortunately, when I graduated, it was kind of during a recession that we had going on. So it wasn't the best like job market. So I think the biggest thing is when I was applying, um, it, it was kind of hard, you know, at first getting out there and and I was putting in a lot of applications, but there really wasn't a whole lot of jobs. And, um, you know, but just being persistent and sticking with it, um, that I eventually, you know, found a position with OAM and that was great. And actually I started out, I've been in several roles here. So I started out in check-in and check-out and then I went to customer service IME billing and then I went to payment posting and now I'm, I do the auto and the Medicaid. So. You got to be open to just kind of, you know, different opportunities with billing because there is so many different aspects of it. Um, we do have a coding department as well. So we work um, pretty much in tandem with coding and with our prior authorization department. So we all kind of work together to get those claims paid because the, the prior authorization team, they, they're kind of the ones who, who get that initial authorization. The coders are the ones who put it in. And, you know, um, so it's all of us working together. So there's a lot of different avenues you can go through with billing. And sometimes if you're in a smaller practice, it's more of a, um, you actually do all those together. So you do coding and, and the authorizations and, and everything all in one. So it's, it's not like separate jobs, but um, I think that, you know, just when I was going into billing, I didn't really know exactly what area I was gonna go into. So um, just learning on the job has been a big thing for me. Um, School kind of prepared me. I think that you definitely need um, a background in coding, I would suggest, if you're going to go into billing, because it helps out a lot if you understand the different codes and um, you're able to, to understand maybe why something's denying. So I think that definitely having a background in that and even in like a human anatomy and understanding the different body parts, because sometimes I write up, sometimes I send it to coding with some of the appeals I write up myself. So just understanding 
um, that part of it. A lot of time I structure, if I'm writing an appeal, I structure that, you know, kind of like a, a writing where I've got like my thesis and I've got my evidence to prove it. So, and a lot of that stuff I, I learned in college. So I think that, you know, even though some of my job didn't relate to necessarily my education, it prepared me for it in some ways. So that was good. Yeah, that's so great. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Eric, I know for a lot of young people, they're wondering like what their undergrad, there's so much pressure to figure out just the right undergrad degree. Help us understand what that like was for you and then kind of the general education path, but really maybe something that you would want them to know about the education side. I know you shared a little bit about even that pre-PT club. Yeah, yep. so my, my undergrad was in health science. So um, a lot of the, the core classes that were required for me to take to get to apply into PT school and graduate school um, kind of go, go along with the same thing that a lot of like pre-nursing, um, occupational therapy, speech therapy, and physician's assistants uh, needed. Um, so I, I kind of knew like when I went that route, I'm like, okay, like, you know, if I'm not into the PT thing still, like there's still, you know, some other medical aspects that I, I could apply to, like if, if I needed to. Um, and so, uh, you know, what I would suggest, you know, again, is, you know, really kind of look at like the, the core classes that you need. Um, you know, I didn't even think when I was going into undergrad, like, you know, I didn't even think like any other degrees or majors or anything like that. I'm like, okay, I'm going into healthcare. I need health, like science. Like, you know, once I got into grad school, like, you know, we introduce everybody that first day and, you know, I hear like, you know, one of my classmates is like uh, an English major. Another one was a marketing major. Another one was a French major. And, you know, they just took like the core classes they needed, but then they took whatever path for the degree that, or for the major degree that they wanted. And looking back, if I could do it over again, like, I would probably do something a different major, but still have the same core classes needed for the graduate school. That way, like, like as, as I found, like, you know, everybody told me like, oh, you're going to healthcare. Like there always be a need for it. We didn't know a pandemic was gonna happen. Um, and uh, the, you know, physical therapists were still essential medical workers, um, but the uh, caseload did drop down dramatically. And the clinic that I was working at when the pandemic started actually closed down. And so I was, I was off of work for a little bit and nobody knew what was going to happen with, you know, volumes of patients and stuff like that. So it was hard. And I'm thinking, I'm like, you know, if I had a different degree, like even like a, like a, some sort of business or marketing, like background, like that's something that, you know, I could actually like fall back on as well. Um, and then, you know, as I've been in the practice now, for, I've been working now for like 12 years, you know, worked in private practice. I've worked in medical and like hospital settings. Um, some of those things like marketing, like, you know, they're very useful tools for, you know, a, a practice owner or a, you know, if you're, you know, managing or if you're, you know, working in an office or, you know, regardless of the size, like being able to, to figure out other ways that you can get your brand out there. Um, you know, those are just other, other things I never would have thought of, like, when I started this path, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that I'm still being able to work as a therapist. Um, that's what I want to do. Um, but there's just so many other things that, you know, you don't know until you're, you're living it. And I think that's really one of the hot tips for tonight that you just shared, because I think young people think you have to get a biology degree or you have to get a health science degree, that that's a, that's a, a must. But I've heard that from other professionals. It can be in a variety of undergrads. It's just important that you get the prerequisites needed for that PT program. Right. So and, that, and that's where, it, yeah. that's where, that's where the, the meeting with that, um, with that, the counselor or the career path, uh, you know, people is, is very helpful because they can guide you and go, you know, help you along the way. And, um, you know, and just being, you know, being aware of what, you know, if you are going to grad school, what that school's requirements are too, because each school is going to be a little different. Like central Michigan is a little bit different than Grand Valley as far as their prereqs. So, you know, just being aware of, you know, what similarities there are um, in order to, to, get, to the, get that next point. Thank you very much. Um, I hope that was helpful for young people because um, there's a lot of anxiety, right? That you have to have it all figured out when you get done right. with high school. And there's some flexibility nope. in there. <laughs> there's the, you just, just got to find the people around you to, to help you on the path. Exactly. What about you, Lisa, when you look back at your education? Were there any things that you would do differently or things that were really helped you be successful through the college portion? Yeah, I don't know if I would have 
done anything differently. I'm kind of, I like how everything fell into place. And some of it was really just a few key moments. There was a lot of times where I still didn't know if this was the right path. I didn't know if it was the right choice or if it will even lead to a potential job opportunity. Um, business is a great background and there are jobs in it, but a lot of companies look for experience. So um, there's always just a few key moments of making those connections, you know, helping guide those decisions based on those that are encouraging you because there are some that you know may not be encouraging but I had a few I had one professor say you know you could really be in an HR manager role someday and I never would have pictured myself in that previously um, so that's really what encouraged me to look at grad school and when I was looking at grad school I looked at their placement rate too for um, their success rate of people finding um, positions in that field upon graduation so I wasn't going to spend that money I wasn't going to take out those student loans without knowing that I may have a uh, a high chance of getting a position after graduating. So they had a high placement rate. I think at that time it was like a 98% placement rate um, for a full-time position after graduation. So that's really kind of what led me to going on to grad school. It's certainly not required in human resources. You can get into other ways and get into the field in a lot of different avenues and you don't necessarily have to have a degree in human resources, but that certainly helped accelerate my career. And I think having those few key moments of people that actually believed in you and encouraged you, you know, take advantage of that and, and hold on to that and use that. Yeah. And if, and if that, if you have a network that's not developed, you know, as Eric even shared with that pre PT club and all that, like be intentional young people, like seek that out because so many people want to help you. So mm -hmm. if you don't have a strong support system from your own family or community, you know, be intentional about building that because it really does pay off. Thank you everybody for sharing that. Um, what are the questions think, that come, go ahead. Eric. Sorry, just kind of piggyback off yeah. of that. Like, you know, I know, especially now, like certain clinics and, and healthcare fields, it is very different than what it was, you know, three years ago, you know, and if you're trying to talk to, you know, if you don't have a connection in healthcare and you're trying to talk to, you know, you call clinic A down the road and be like, hey, you know, what is it like, you know, can I have somebody to talk to you? Like, can I have interview or can I have a shadow or anything like that? Like if the first person says no, like don't take it personal just go, go to the next one. Like there's, there'll always be somebody willing to, to lend the hand to kind of help you in your career. You just got to find that right person. I love that. I think that's so important for young people to hear that, that just cause you're not going to, they say, no, keep trying. But I would think that the fact is most adults want to help young people figure it out, don't we? And if you, if we can, we will. And so Lisa, I'll just give you one second before I go back um, uh, to Maddie. Um, OAM, you have job shadows. Tell us what some requirements are and how a young person might do that. Yes, so we do offer job shadows, but we do require individuals to be at least 18 years or older and be enrolled in some sort of related field. Um, so we do wait until you're 18. Um, but once you're 18 and enrolled in school, we can set that up. And there's information on our website on setting up a, a shadow job shadow. And it's oamichigan.com. I think it's under our careers section. Yeah, and, and there's and not all clinics you have to be 18. So that's why young people, you know, find out who you know in your community through social media, but, you know, knocking on doors, a lot of um, people really admire your um, taking that initiative and the, they might let you come in for an hour or two. So thank you for that. Um, Maddie, people love to know what's your favorite part of your job and what's your least favorite? Yeah, I think um, my favorite part I would have to say is um, the instant relief with, with bracing specifically. So we find it a lot with like our spine, um, you know, people with chronic low back pain or spine patients or um, people with knee um, arthritis, just knee pain in general. Um, it's, it's, you know, like a back brace. If you put a back brace on them, you position it correctly, you educate them on how to use it, how to adjust it, um, kind of find what works best for you. And then I always tell people to take a walk down the hall let's see how you feel. And it's like that instant, like they're just standing a little bit taller and they're like, I haven't felt this good you know, in a long, long time. And um, it can be such a great alternative to surgery if they're um, wanting to kind of go the more conservative route, you know, with bracing and in accordance with um, therapy as well, um, can do a lot to ward off surgery if people are kind of, you know, either they're, they're like, I'm still young, I want to, um, you know, I want to do what I want love to do and that kind of thing. And a lot of times, um, too, with like knee bracing and that kind of thing, if they love, um, they love gardening, or they love taking walks with, 
you know, their kids or their spouse, or they want to play in the yard with their grandkids or whatever it may be. Um, just being a small part and getting them back to what they love to do and what they're wanting to do day to day is I think my, my favorite part of this. Um, my least favorite is, uh, you know, you can't help everybody sometimes, you know, though you want to, and though you do your best to, um, sometimes it's not, you know, it's not going to be every single person that you can get that instant relief or that, that good fix for them. So um, just kind of being aware of that and then um, knowing when to refer elsewhere. You know, we have an orthotist on staff, um, you know, we can refer out to prosthetics um, and they can really almost like customize something specifically for the patient, which is a really, really cool field as well. Um, they can custom make all these different things to, um, you know, to the patient to, to make them do exactly what they want to do or to um, align better with uh, what the physician wants in terms of outcomes. Um, but yeah, just knowing, knowing that you can't help everybody sometimes. And sometimes a brace is just a quick fix, fix true to, um, to get them to surgery. And sometimes they have to try it. And it, sometimes it doesn't have to work, you know, it, it can't work in order for them to go to their next route. So just, I think that's probably my least favorite part, part but it's all, you know, part of the job as well. So yeah, that's that's great. And I did put mm -hmm. in the chat, uh, orthotist, that's a, definitely a job that young people don't know about. So again, mm -hmm. they're the people making the braces. Um, mm -hmm. And that can be anything from a, like a helmet for a baby yeah. who's right, it's got a misshapen head or yeah. Um, so yeah, young people, if you don't know what that is, check it out. It's uh, mm -hmm. orthotists and prosthetists. It's a really um, cool field. O and P, I've mm -hmm. learned. Yeah. That's, what yeah. that really acronym yeah. is, so. that's great. Yeah. Um, Megan, what is your favorite and least favorite part of your job? Um, I think my favorite part kind of is a two part. Um, I love the team that I work with. Everybody in billing is so supportive. Um, if somebody has to go away or, or they're on vacation or something's going on, then everybody steps in to help. Um, a lot of really good communication between the team and um, between leadership and us just to kind of, you know, make sure everything's transparent, which I really like. Um, and I would say that I also really like being able to help patients. I've had some patients who have been dealing with some auto claims that have gone back years and, you know, and you, dealing with auto insurance can be frustrating. So just being able to help them to get their claims paid and just to give them some direction. Cause sometimes they just, they just don't know where to start or, you know, should I call this? Should I call my attorney? Should I call the adjuster? So just being able to give them um, some peace of mind to know that I I'm looking out for them and I, I'm trying to get their claims paid. I think those are kind of my favorite parts. Yeah, that's very rewarding. What about the least part, favorite part of your job? Auto insurance. Um, <laughs> yeah, auto insurance adjusters <laughs> and Medicaid people sometimes. But no, um, I would say one thing that was kind of frustrating, it's getting better, but I think technology sometimes can be a little frustrating. Um, we were working, a lot of us are working from home and sometimes it's just a little slower working from home. And I just like to be fast paced. So sometimes I'm like, let's, let's go, come on, you know? So sometimes that can get kind of frustrating. It is getting better, but, um, and then sometimes when I have a claim that I can't get paid for a patient that, um, you know, maybe their Medicaid insurance isn't gonna backdate that far, or, you know, their adjuster is not really willing to work with us, or, you know, that's, that's hard to have to tell a patient that, but I try to help them the best I can and at least give them some suggestions, so. Yeah, to hear what advocate you are. That's that's fantastic. Eric, what about you? Least and or best and least. So the the least favorite part, I'm pretty sure if you ask 99% of PTs will be the documentation. Um, all the computer that goes into you know filling out a note to, in order to get paid, um, but it's an essential part of the job. Uh, the the favorite part is there's there's a couple of them. Uh, first one is just in general, when somebody comes in and they're, you know, I, I deal a lot with spines. Um, and so when they're coming in and even just having a hard time just standing up straight and they're in intense pain and like, you know, I can teach them an exercise or two to do and walk out the, the, the door feeling like 70, 80% better in like a half hour, 45 minutes. Like that's an amazing feel. Uh, another area that I do have interest in is uh, working with those at amputations and so being able to, to see them kind of take their steps or, and see their family members faces too, when they start to take their steps for the first time on that, on that prosthesis uh, is always a, a great feeling. And then, so one, one more thing that with, with being in the medical field, 
you know, there's all sorts of aspects of jobs that you can have. You know, I get to work, uh, you know, occupational therapists. I get to work with the doctors and gays, uh, with nurses, as well as uh, in, in some places where I've worked in the past, like speech therapy too. And so I get to be a like the big giant medical team um, and have communication just to kind of you can help patients uh, where they need it the most. Yeah, I, I might, my internet seems to be a little wonky right now, but go ahead and just give us, um, and I'm going to move to you next, Lisa, about your best and uh, least favorite, but just give us a quick, Eric, of the different professionals that you work with that make up a team, because I think young people might get even focused on PT and not realize that there's physical therapy assistants and uh, yeah. other people are doing part of that team. So go ahead and lay that out for us. So, you know, there's a physical therapist, physical therapy assistants, and they We'll see patients on their own, the guidance of a PT. We do work with athletic trainers in the clinic too sometimes. Um, and they kind of uh, are doing the same thing, uh, working underneath the PT, um, just uh, having their own caseload, um, treating them. Uh, we have rehab techs uh, where, where I currently at OAM. Um, and they um, are there to kind of help out within the gym, help out with some patients with their exercises. They kind of help keep the area clean. Um, and that's a great way for people to get experience uh, and observation hours there too is to to be a, a tech and, and you know work that uh, you know while trying to get your hours in. Um, we communicate oftentimes with nurses um, that work with a physician. Uh, we communicate with PAs, the physician assistants, uh, physicians of course, um, speech therapists, uh, occupational therapists, um, and even sometimes like the, the caseworkers and insurances, um, try not to deal with insurances, as, as, try to do that as little as I can, uh, let those that are better at it, <laughs> um, you know, and, and even the people behind the scenes that like, like Megan and, and stuff like that, like, even as you're talking, like, you know, you're, you're doing way more than, you know, anybody ever appreciate, appreciates you for, so. Thank you for just helping young people understand um, all those jobs so that they just have that more, uh, more awareness of what. Can be yeah. happening. Um, so Lisa, what about you? What are your favorite and least favorite parts of your work on a daily basis? Yeah, so there's so many different things that I like. Um, I like just dealing with pretty much all aspects of the business. So we have to have a good understanding of pretty much every role within OEM because we are recruiting and finding that talent, um, helping with some of the training and initiatives for um, getting new team members on board, helping them understand OEM, um, understand just the basic nuances of how to navigate the building and how to log into the systems. Um, so orienting and onboarding them um, and just dealing with some of the really fun positive access, uh, aspects. We get to work on a lot of process improvements and focus a lot on our culture that is huge right now. Um, so it's just really fun what we do and um, get to use a lot of different skills and get to connect with a lot of different people within OEM and in without with our external partners too. Um, what I like the least um, in this position in human resources, you're never done at the end of the day. So if you're a person that likes to check things off and be able to feel like you've gotten everything done at the end of the day, that does not happen in a role. We have some projects that take months, if not sometimes years to complete and some things you're never going to stop working. You know, we're going to always continue to improve certain processes and procedures. So just knowing that um, some things are left unfinished every single day can be um, challenging to learn how to handle that. Yeah, that, thanks for pointing that out because I think that's one of those things you don't know until you're actually in it um, as far as what you need out of your job every day. Um, so if, crossing off your list, like you say, and finishing it. And I imagine all of you have those kind of days where <laughs> not quite getting through it all. Um, so schools, uh, we have about 10 minutes left. Um, Schools are really trying to teach young people what we call employability skills or life skills, you know, things like teamwork, communication, even critical thinking. When you think about your roles, what are some of those that are important? And I, what would you like young people to know? Like, yeah, that's why they're teaching you that because you really will use that in the real world. Um, Maddie, is there anything that comes to mind for you? Um, yes, many things. So um I think Lisa mentioned culture right now is huge, huge. Um, and um, communication, just communication on anything like, you know, in healthcare specifically, you deal with so many different disciplines of healthcare, you know, whether it be the clinical staff, the physician, the billing team, therapists, registration staff, 
um, you know, radiology, um, the urgent care, there's just so many different entities that you kind of um, are in constant communication with um, and making sure that that stuff is as streamlined as possible really, really needs a, a good amount of good effective communication. Um, so I think that's one of the biggest things. Um, I think just a positive attitude to, to be able to foster a good work culture is super important, um, especially this you know day and age where staffing shortages are just seem never ending. Unfortunately, um, you know making sure that um, that you know you're you're coming in, you're positive, you're ready to go, you're ready to to you know be on your game and. Um, and that kind of thing, at least for us, you know, we have a very busy clinic, um, as any, everyone here can attest to. Um, so just making sure that, you know, you're, you're doing your best to promote a good positive work environment between um, you and your peers and, every, and your patients, especially. Um, I think compassion um, is a huge thing in healthcare. You're, you're, you know, if you're in a patient facing role, you know, specifically, and then, you know, as Megan was saying on the billing end, just being an advocate for patients. Um, you know, as best as possible, it can get, it can get difficult. It can get tricky. Um, not everyone is um, <laughs> willing to take the compassion as easily as others, uh, just kind of depending. But um, I think those are, are probably the, the biggest things, the biggest, you know, attributes that I can think of, especially in my role specifically. Thank you, Maddie. I appreciate that. How about you, Megan? What comes to mind? Um, I definitely think that communication is really essential and just knowing how to even just knowing how to compose an email um, that's, you know, appropriate because sometimes you wouldn't think that that would be an issue, but it can be. So sometimes just, you know, knowing how to how to compose an email, um, how to talk to patients. Um, I, I don't see any, obviously, in the clinical setting, but even just to know how to, to call patients, to speak with them, um, to be able to have empathy. Um, and then I would also say that uh, being adaptable is really important. Um, I, like I said, I've been in several different roles and some of them, I didn't even, some of them, I didn't even really know what they were, but, you know, just being able to adapt and to be able to train and to learn. And, you know, if you reach out to, to team members who, who are helpful and you all work together for the same goal, I think just learning to, to be supportive of each other. Yeah, that sounds like what it, it sounds like it really contributes to OAM's culture that mm -hmm. helping each other out. Because like you say, that is so important today with pe people having choices of going to other places. How about you, Eric, when you think about employability skills or other attributes? <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I definitely agree with all of those that are said. Um, communication is huge. Um, I think uh, critical thinking and problem solving um, is one of the favorite parts about like treating a patient for me. Um, just knowing that like you may come in, you may expect a patient coming in with, and you have one thing in mind, um, and they come in presenting totally different. And so you got to be able to be able to, to, to kind of think on your feet and know that, okay, like I tried plan A, that's not working. Let's try plan B. Okay. Is this working? Yes. No. Okay. Let's try plan C. And like, and know that there's not one specific exercise or there's not one specific treatment plan that's going to work for everybody that you encounter. Like, and that's kind of what makes it fun. It makes it different. Every patient is unique in that aspect. Um, and so it does, you know, it, you know, I love doing puzzles and playing games as a kid. So, you know, that, that critical thinking just kind of along with, with that, um, by helping patient out. And then, uh, you know, the Megan had the, the word empathy, uh, you know, for, I think that's one that you can really teach in school, but you know, you, you learn it through life, um, you know, and learning how to, you know, how, so one patient's feeling something, you know, is negatively or positively affecting their life and being able to, to put yourself in their shoe and have their perspective because on the outside, you know, they were, their world is completely different than what they're living on the inside. Oh, that's good stuff, you guys. Um, and if we have educators watching this, you know, how are we teaching communication? How do we, how can we teach empathy or how can we teach positive attitudes and, and teamwork in school? How can we practice those skills so that young people are ahead of the game? Lisa, did anything come to mind that you'd like to share around some of those skills? Yeah, so I think they all had some, some great answers and I think it kind of shows that every one of us have a role in patient care and, and that compassion, whether we're behind the scenes or treating patients. I mean, I 
run into patients and help them wayfind around the building and things like that too. So even in our roles, we have interactions with patients. Um, I think in human resources beyond that, um, I still use quite a bit of finance and math skills. Um, Excel is huge. <laughs> we run so many different reports in Excel. Um, part of it is we have to um, develop a business case and really cost analysis for a lot of things that we do. So I'm in Excel quite a bit. Um, and then that written communication. So we write policies, we write emails, we write things that go out on our social media site. Um, so I actually had somebody in college recommend reading your reports backwards, um, which sounds strange, but it really makes you take a look at your spelling, um, punctuation, um, your what words you're using, whether it's too much, too little. So I don't do it all the time, but if it's something really important, I, I use that still sometimes. I hadn't heard that strategy. It's very interesting. <laughs> um, for those of you that are on this talk and tour today, we unfortunately had some technical difficulties with a video to show you kind of behind the scenes of OAM. I want to just give each of you um, just a chance if there's anything you could just describe about your environment. You know, what would you want the young people to know? Um, I, I don't know if anything comes to mind. So I'll start with you, Maddie. Does anything yeah. come to mind? Um, just our work environment, really? Yeah. Um, for us, we are a very busy clinic. So um, multitasking, you know, is, is huge. Um, being on your feet, like running around, it's, it's fun. Like, I love that aspect of it. I love being busy. Um, it just, it, you know, it's, it's great for us. It's great for patients, like getting people, you know, in and getting people out. It's, they feel good. Everyone's happy. Um, but I think that's, um, that's, that's one of the, the biggest things with us anyway, just busy being able to multitask, um, you know, do a couple different things at different times. Um, I would say that's the biggest thing. And then, and then being a team through it all, you know, you know, things get frustrating, you know, busy times can lead to, you know, things slipping through the cracks or getting frustrating. But I think yeah, that again, warps in that uh, communication and making sure we're all, we're all on the same team. We're all trying to achieve the same thing for the patient and the physician and everything. And if we all keep that kind of stuff in mind, then, um, then it, it usually tends to run quite smoothly. So. I would think one of your perks too is you get to wear athletic wear to work every day. Oh, I used to. No, I wear scrubs, which oh, is actually scrubs. better. Yeah, so <laughs> or very similar. Yeah, so we used. I used to when I was in the the school setting, we would wear um, team gear, which was awesome because all that stuff we got, you know, supplied for us, which was really fun. But um, but scrubs, I love. You know, it's it's easy. Wash it, wear it. You don't really have to think about it every day. So yeah, either way is great. But <laughs> yeah, I know that those are even some factors that young people think about. Like they want to wear yeah. scrubs. Like like they, they can see themselves in scrubs, right? So that, totally. like, where, what can I do that I can wear scrubs? Yeah. Um, we have about two minutes left. So Eric, um, anything you want to just say about the work environment? And then we'll go into a kind of a final word of wisdom. Yeah, uh, the scrubs is awesome. Uh, <laughs> I, I love wearing athletic wear and scrubs kind of have that feel to it. Um, but, uh, you know, our clinic is very busy. Uh, there's a couple, uh, there's four other physical therapists, two techs that I work with. Um, one front desk person and there's there the gym is always crowded with patients um, you know we got treadmills we got ellipticals we got uh, cable machines we've got um, mat tables and you know exercise balls and all that stuff uh, at our at our hands to to use to to help the patients um, you know there's it's always fun you can eat you know I've interacted with jobs and people that I never would have thought I would have um, and so that's that's so that's probably one of the one of the better things too. Yeah, and, and I'm sorry we're running out of time on that because I, I do want young people to understand there's a gym, there's radiology departments back there. Um, obviously, the equipment room where you're getting your fitted for your prosthesis or, or uh, you know, braces and all that. Mm -hmm. So well, young people just understand that, you know, it's, it's, it's lots to it. And so yeah. if you're 18, we can get them for a job shadow. Um, final word of wisdom. That's what we're going to focus right now. So Maddie. You have young people listening to you and they're yeah. not sure what they want to be when they grow up. What do you want them to know? Um, I think truly, and this might sound a touch cliche, but really follow what you're interested in and, and discover and try to discover all the things that might be associated with that. You know, whether, you know, whether it be different, different aspects of what you're interested in. I think that's probably the biggest thing. Really follow what you like because you're going to be doing it for a long time. Um, so you know, yeah, just find something you love or that you're interested in and just, and just find people that might have similar, um, you know, similar professions or experiences or that kind of thing. And then see, you know, see what they have to say. Maybe they have other ideas for professions that are similar that might align more with what you like. So I think, yeah, if you're going to be doing it in a while, make sure it's something you like, 
for sure. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, and keep trying things, young people. You don't know what you don't know. How about you, mm -hmm. Megan? Any final word of wisdom? I would say definitely look into scholarships, look into different programs. Um, some community colleges offer a four and or a three in one program, which is really nice because then you're not paying university prices. So just be open to different options because realize if you take out student loans, you're probably going to have to pay them back. So just, you know, make smart choices and talk to an advisor and, um, you know, just make sure that you have someone with you on the path. Great advice, great sage wisdom. And for young people, a lot of healthcare facilities have tuition reimbursement. Um, so definitely as you're looking ahead at potential student loans, find out what some of the healthcare facilities are offering around that. So yeah, scholarships to grants, awesome. Uh, Eric, what about you? Yeah, I think the you know, biggest thing is explore, uh, explore your opportunities, explore your interests. Um, you know, if it's something that you're interested in, uh, it won't be as much work, but it'll be, you know, it'll be fun. It'll be something you, you know, you look doing and, and have, uh, and have, uh, you know, have a passion for, um, you know, just align yourself with the people that are along you that are encouraging, you know, find the people that are going to help guide you on that path. Um, you know, you got the a whole lot of sources and in, in people around you, as well as when I started out, like, you know, we looked a little bit at the internet, but there's so many more resources now than, than when I started. Uh, so yeah, just, you know, just keep your eye open. And when you find something that, that you like, like you'll know it and, you know, just persevere, keep working hard and, and you'll get there. Yeah, that's great. Um, Lisa, you had our final, final word tonight. The pressure. Um, I think probably the biggest thing is give yourself grace. It's okay to not have it all figured out all at once. It's going to take some time for some people. Some have it figured out right away. Some don't. So um, take advantage of your resources, um, whether it's different classes, advisors, books. Um, I read What Colors Your Parachute when I was trying to figure out um, what I wanted to do. So that was another good resource um, as well as some of those personality tests, just trying to figure out where, where I wanted to go. So take advantage of those resources. Try and establish those relationships with advisors, professors, other students. Um, the student organizations are a great resource too to kind of get information on different um, avenues and aspects. So um, take time to really figure out what you want to do. And then look at that end game too of what type of career you ought to have because you're hoping to find a good career in your field with the schedule that you like and things like that. So that all is important, but it takes time to figure that out sometimes. Absolutely. Thank you guys for being such um, great role models tonight. Um, I want to let the people who are, are still on the Zoom that I have some resources to help you with the actual research of how much money do you make and what a typical day is like and what kind of education, some of those factual things. So stick around and I'll share uh, some internet resources with you. But I wanted to, again, thank our role models um, for your valuable time on such a beautiful night. We appreciate you. Thank, thank you so much, much for having us. Having us. Thank yeah, you for thank you.